Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. I think we'll make a start. It's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research um, here at the University of Bath and based in this building. And I'm delighted uh, this afternoon that we're welcoming to the university uh, Stian Westlake and Jonathan Haskell, who are the authors of this um, really important new book, Capitalism Without Capital, which many of you, I hope, will have read about in the press. It's been really well reviewed. People like Martin Wolf and others have uh, devoted columns to it. Um, we were joking, actually, that um, uh, you, you stand, you know, you're sat here surrounded by plenty of tangible investment. The university is building things all over the place. always does. This is a new building, very nice lecture facilities. But this, is really, this book is all about the intangible economy and what it means to us, to, in, in the kind of, particularly in the kind of contemporary debates about inequality, about stagnation, secular stagnation, uh, the productivity crisis that Britain is experiencing, um, can some of these contemporary challenges to economics and public policy be addressed through the lens of the rise of the intangible economy? So that is the focus of the uh, lecture you're about to hear from uh, Jonathan and Stian. Um, I'm going to let them talk about the main thesis. I won't try to preempt any of that. Um, but uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions and debate afterwards um, so we can you know, uh, go over what, you, what, what we hear and uh, chew over the, the issues to debate because it's a very important, interesting subject with many different dimensions, so there'll be a lot to talk about uh, in the rest of the session. So over to you, Jonathan Stian. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you all of, all of you for joining us today. Um, when we think about our book, we, we think it's interesting because clearly there are a whole ton of problems that we face in the economy at the moment, social problems, economic problems, one thing that people are particularly worried about is this economic problem of secular stagnation. Why is productivity and investment, why does it appear to be lagging, even though companies seem to be making high profits and there's kind of amazing technologies around? Why is that happening? Why is there secular stagnation? Why is there so much inequality? Why is the gap between the rich and the poor, the gap between the wealthy or the high income earners and those who don't do so well, why does that appear to be growing so much? Why is our financial system so broken? Here's some Occupy Wall Street protesters. Why is it doing such a bad job of backing what we think of as the real economy? Um, and finally, from a political point of view, why is populism on the rise? Why is there this kind of growing gap between kind of elite metropolises around the world and left-behind places? Um, one standard critique for this is that there's just something going wrong with capitalism in general. Um, this is a fundamental contradiction in capitalism that is being revealed in all sorts of dysfunctional ways. Um, but part of what we talk about in the book is an alternative explanation, that perhaps it's because something very fundamental in, capital, in capitalism is changing. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now to talk about the first aspect of this, and that is the rise of the intangible economy, something very different in the way investment happens in our economy that's changing. And then we'll move on from there. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming out uh, this evening. So our book, oh, I should have mentioned, it's available over there for a fantastic Bath University only price of 20 quid. Uh, our book consists of three bits, uh, as Stian has just said. Uh, we document the rise of the intangible economy. I'll say something about that. I'll say something about why we think intangible capital is different, uh, why this all matters. And then I'll pass back to Stian just to break things up a little bit uh, to ask what this means for business and the economy. So let's just get um, straight to it. So the core of our book is the following notion. It is the notion that the nature of investment in developed economies has changed very profoundly. On the left-hand side, if you look at the screen, you can see the typical types of tangible investments that Nick just referred to uh, in his uh, introduction. These are the kinds of investments uh, which are well known to accountants. These are the kinds of investments that featured in GDP, and they are intangible things. Buildings, computers, plant machinery, uh, and vehicles. And when the people who developed national income accounting, that is to say accounting for GDP, and the people who developed company accounting first kind of tried to think about what types of investments they wanted to count, those were very natural types of investments to count. So especially the people who developed GDP, for example, in the 1930s and the 1940s, Britain was going through tremendous, you know, wartime construction and all of that. Those tangible investments were a very logical thing to count. Uh, the core of our book, however, is to argue that there's been a tremendous change uh, 
in the nature, as I mentioned, of these investments. And instead, what economies and companies are doing much more is they're investing in intangible investments. So let me just be absolutely clear what intangible investments actually are. They're investments you can't touch and feel, and so here they are up on the right-hand side of the screen for you. So, for example, R&D. Right? Lots of people in this university are doing R&D, inventing new things and all that kind of thing. It's an intangible investment. It's just an idea. Uh, what about training? Uh, so many companies, especially in financial services, spend very large amounts of money training their employees. So again, it's not giving a tangible investment like a building or anything or something like that, but it's make, making an intangible investment, investment you can't touch and feel, but hopefully it's, which is going to uh, uh, be of a lasting value uh, to that company. Uh, design. Um, so again, uh, I... I uh, I have the privilege to work at Imperial College. Rolls Royce are coming to Imperial all, all, all the time. You know, one of the big things they're doing, of course, is they're doing lots of new design. So that's a, that's an important issue as well. Uh, organizational development is another type of intangible investment. Uh, if you think about, you know, if you go to Aldi and if you go to Sainsbury's, you know, they both sell goods and, and services, but somehow or other they're kind of different. So there's something gonna, there's something different that corporations are doing when they're investing in the types of uh, um, organizational processes and the business processes and so forth, uh, which drive the success or failure of companies. Brands and marketing is an obvious important intangible investment. Uh, uh, and uh, likewise, artistic originals, people writing books, movies, films. Here's Britain's most famous innovation here. Uh, uh, th this is going to be a very important intangible investment. And lastly, uh, software and data. So if you're wondering where that comes into the picture, again, it's an intangible investment uh, by firms. And of course, firms are spending huge amounts of money on software. Um, again, I mentioned the banking sector before. The banking sector doesn't really do any R&D, but it does a gigantic amount of software. And more recently, of course, uh, using big data uh, is a key kind of intangible investment uh, of which uh, firms are spending very considerable um, amounts of money. Okay, so it's that shift from <coughs> tangible to intangible that's what's behind the book. Now, you might say, well, yeah, so, you know, isn't this all obvious? Don't we kind of know all about it? If we, you know, if we go into Tesco's and do our shopping, we know that we're giving them data and they've got the software to, uh, you know, do we, we can do our own checkout and all that kind of thing. Uh, what we think is kind of interesting about this is that this change actually turns out to be somewhat hidden. So let me say why it is. If we just go to GDP for a second... Uh, GDP has been counting tangible investments since the 1940s, as I mentioned earlier on. The originators of GDP, when they were inventing kind of how to count GDP, had these types of tangible investments in mind. Over the years, national income accountants have counted more and more intangible investments. So in the early 1990s, they decided to count spending on software as an investment, artistic originals likewise, more recently R&D, but it's taken a long time for those intangible investments to be incorporated into GDP, and there's still a load of other intangible investments which aren't counted organizational development and branding and all that kind of thing. So if you were to ask the question, where do I see you know, the organizational development that firms put into business process and en engineering and the types of investment that they're doing in that regard, where do I see that in GDP? You don't see that in GDP because that's not counted as an investment. All right, uh, so that's on the GDP side. And you might say, well, GDP, I mean, you know, everybody knows that GDP is this fatally flawed measure of things. Um, and we all know that GDP is terribly imperfect. And there's a whole a very active public debate um, about the uh, usefulness or otherwise of GDP. So you might have very low expectations for GDP. If you think GDP is not doing very, a very good job, you should look at company accounting. <laughs> company accounting, it turns out, is even more, well, I shouldn't say even more useless, is completely useless. Uh, so this is a, a, a graph here taken from a book which I strongly recommend uh, by Baruch Lev from Feng Gu. And the argument in the book is all in the title. The title is called The End of Accounting. Uh, and you, it's all summarized in this graph here. Let me just walk you through this graph very quickly. What this graph does, and this is their graph, it does the following. Take the firms on the U.S. stock market. Take all the firms who entered in the 1950s and ask the question, how much of their market value can we explain by their tangible assets? Right? Those are sort of traditional 1950s firms. For those of you who've maybe done a little bit of economics, a little bit of statistics, this is a kind of an R squared from that kind of regression. Okay? And the answer is about 85% of the variance in the market value for those 1950s firms you can explain uh, by, uh, the by the assets uh, on their books. Now you do the same thing for the firms who entered 
uh, the stock market in the 2000s and ask how much of their market value, the variance of their market value, can you explain by their assets? And the answer is about 25%. That's why the book, as I say, is called The End of Accounting. It essentially points out that company accounts are almost completely uninformative about the types of assets which modern corporations are, are increasingly employing. So corporations over here on the right are going to be the Googles and the Facebooks and, 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 and all that kind of thing. And indeed, if you look at their assets, if you actually go to their accounts, you will see almost nothing on their accounts in terms of assets. So um, Microsoft, for example, have got 80-odd billion worth of sales. They've got about 5 billion worth of assets, and they're basically all the buildings. And there's nothing else on their accounts in terms of assets. No software, no branding, no nothing. Uh, so company accountants... Uh, uh, company accounts uh, that therefore uh, uh, um, aren't saying about much of this, and that's why we think, as I say, this change um, is hidden. Now, once you've written a book on intangibles, you see intangibles absolutely everywhere. And rather than giving a sort of tech example, which is an obvious one, so Google have obviously got a big intangible asset, namely their software, Microsoft likewise their software, uh, we see intangibles absolutely everywhere. So rather than a tech example, we've got the example of going to the gym. So here's a picture of 1977. Uh, this is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's gym, so Pumping Iron was Arnold Schwarzenegger's kind of breakthrough movie. Uh, and you see lots of tangible assets in this picture. Namely, you see the building and you see the machines upon which they're doing the exercises. Uh, here's a picture of a 2018 gym uh, and it kind of looks on the face of it rather much the same. You've got a building, maybe a little bit more tidy. Uh, you've got a building and you've got um, uh, machines there. So again, it all looks very tangible. But if you look a little bit harder, what we document in the book is there's actually quite a lot of intangible assets there as well. So, for example, the software, which records when you come in and how much exercise you do and all that kind of thing. Uh, there's training and processes, so the people, uh, you know, the uh, uh, people who work there who kind of help you do the exercises and all that kind of thing, they need training. And there's lots of branding and marketing uh, in and around uh, the gym uh, um, industry. And indeed, there is a company called Les Mills Body Pump they're responsible for, a, for a series of exercises called Body Pump, which if you're not, I mean, you all look very fit and healthy in the audience, I must say. But the few of you who are not familiar with Body Pump, what it is, it's an exercise, you basically do the exercise to music and you lift weights and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this is uh, an incredibly successful global business run by this group called Les Mills. Uh, Les Mills are a New Zealand company. Les Mills was a, um, uh, a 1950s New Zealand uh, Olympic weightlifter. Uh, and their business is essentially a pure intangible business. That is to say, what they do is they go to the music companies and they negotiate the rights of the music. So that's one intangible asset there. Then they design all the various exercises. So there's a bit of design going on there as well. They train the people who help you do the exercises, you know, along to the music and all of that. Uh, and then there's a lot of branding and marketing, obviously. Uh, and I can see on people's faces a lot of people are familiar with it. Uh, so there's lots of branding and marketing, uh, marketing uh, to make sure that people are familiar uh, with what they do. So a, a small New Zealand company, literally worldwide, as a pure kind of intangible, uh, pure intangible business. Okay. Uh, now, more sort of prosaically, because I'm an economist, of course, I like to see lots of graphs of economic data rather than pictures of things. Uh, so more prosaically, uh, here's a little bit of economic data we've put together. Um, and let me just say as a little bit of background, uh, the data that we present in the book essentially does this. It says... Well, a lot of this stuff is missing from GDP and missing from company accounts. So let's go to various other sources. Let's go to surveys of training or surveys of design, for example, um, or surveys of business processes. Let's bring that information in and see if we can measure that missing information, put it into GDP and re-engineer the national accounts and see if we get a different kind of picture. So that's essentially that's the kind of the economics research, uh, which is kind of sits behind the book. Uh, and it give you an example of those kinds of data. So essentially what you can see is you can see this is for uh, the EU, uh, the major EU 11 countries plus the US. You can see in red is the declining tangible investment as a portion of GDP. And the blue is rising intangible investment uh, as a proportion of GDP. And indeed, uh, just around the end of the uh, Great Recession, the financial crisis, there was a bit of a turning point, which is economies are now investing more in intangible assets than they are in tangible assets. Now, if you want to see a longer-run version of this, uh, our friend and collaborator, Carl Corrado, has gone back to the 1940s for the US data. And there you see a long, steady increase 
uh, in the amount of intangible investment that's being done since, since the late 1940s in the US, whereas the red line, which is tangible investment, is sort of more or less flat, is not, not particularly trended. Uh, and again, you see a, a crossing point uh, in this case uh, around the mid-1990s. Um, so uh, we think this intangible investment, there's been a tendency of economies to move towards this intangible investment gradually over the years, uh, and it's now becoming much more important uh, as, a, as a means of investment um, uh, relative to tangible investment. Uh, one thing we, we comment here is you might say it's all tied up with IT. Notice this change predates the IT revolution. Talk about that in just a second. Uh, that's one comment. And then the second comment is since lots of people are writing books with the title capital in the title, uh, we've got to get our own bit. We think that intangible capital is the capital of the 21st century, and we'll talk about um, that a little bit more. Uh, now, let me go back to this issue about which came first the IT or the intangible economy. You, you might just say, well, isn't all this intangible stuff a manifestation of the fact that we've now got all these computers and we've got the internet and they need software and, and, and all that kind of thing? Uh, so let's go back instead uh, to uh, a Lions tea shop. So here's the Lions tea stall, the kind of McDonald's of mid-20th century Britain, as it says there. Uh, and you can see this whole series of, of tea stores, you know, all immensely popular. And uh, the, these tea stores employed lots and lots of, well, they were almost all women, waitresses there. And these waitresses, of course, on part-time jobs and all that, they all needed paying. So there was a tremendous demand for some clever system or other, which would indeed pay, uh, 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 you know, uh, sort out the payroll. Um, so you need lots of payroll clerks uh, for that. And sure enough, uh, what was developed uh, but the Lions Electrical Office called Leo, one of the very er early computers. So that there it is. Uh, I, should, I, I should know how much memory is on that computer, but you know, some tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of you know, what's, on everybody's, uh, what's on everybody's iPhone. Um, and it, and uh, it, there are even a very number of uh, authors um, in the kind of innovation studies literature who've documented that in a, in a sense, this demand for these types of computers and all of that was a demand for information. It was a demand for, you know, having, uh, developing these kind of assets, uh, which would indeed uh, service these very information-intensive um, uh, um, um, businesses. So in a sense, what came first, uh, in, in many ways, the, in, the demand for intangible assets uh, came first. All right. Uh, now, the second part of the book talks about why uh, intangible capital is different. So let me say a word on that. And as I say, I'll pass over to Stian for the third bit about what this means for business and society. Uh, now, what we talk about in the book is we talk about four economic properties of intangibles. And before I tell you about the economic properties, uh, l let me again just try to motivate this a little bit. Y y you might reasonably say, well, why? Well, doesn't the nature of investment just change all the time? So why should we bother worrying about a new type of investment? After all, you know, here we are down in Bath. In the 18, you know, 70s, lots of canals being dug around here. Uh, that was one type of investment. And then there were trains being invented. We got rid of canals. We had trains, another type of investment. And then we started digging roads. That was another type of investment. And then we started making airports. That was another type of investment. So you might say, isn't the nature of investment just changing all the time? So, you know, why should we worry about it? And the reason why we think that intangible investment is of interest is that we think that it's got some interesting economic properties. I'm going to go through the economic properties, and then we're going to use those economic properties to try to say something about the kinds of issues that Stian just talked about, secular stagnation and inequality and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to be a little bit analytical here, reasoning from these analytical properties. These four economic properties, again, if you studied a little bit of economics, you might be familiar with this. The first is about scale. Intangible assets can be used over and over again. I'll say more about all of these things in just a second, but just to run through them. The second thing is something economists call sunk. Once you've spent the, uh, on intangible assets, it's often difficult to get them, get them back. The third is something called spillovers. A firm making an intangible a asset may not receive all the returns. Uh, and the fourth is synergies. Intangible assets often uh, very valuable when combined uh, with each other. So each of these things, just to easy, make them easy to remember, they all begin with an S. So let me go through uh, each one. Let's start with scalability. So here's a picture of the Addison Lee taxi car park. Uh, outside of uh, Euston Station, um, uh, uh, as was. Uh, and um, if you want to, um, so you know, they run minicabs, obviously. If you want uh, to carry another passenger, you've got to have another minicab, right? So that's just the thing. If you run a tangible business, you, know, you want to scale up, you need a bit more tangible assets. On the other hand, if you think about Uber, 
you can, you know, Uber out to the airport, fly to wherever you're flying to, land at the airport where, where you've got to, switch on Uber again. It's the same software. You can use Uber, Uber any way you like. So these intangible assets, first of all, are scalable. They can be used in multiple places with little or no reinvestment. That's the first S. The second S, I mentioned this economics thing of sunkenness. So let me spend a moment on this just in case you're not familiar with this idea about a sunk asset. So uh, here's, uh, let's think about Nokia, Microsoft. If you cast your minds back, Nokia were absolutely dominant in the smartphone business uh, around the mid-2000s. They had about 72% of the world's smartphone business. They were kind of running the entire Finnish economy. Uh, then once the Apple iPhone came out, in basically in about a year and a half, they lost almost everything. Now, Nokia, it turned out, had two big assets. The first, one tangible and one intangible. The first tangible asset is, there's a picture of it on the left-hand side. It's a building. It was their headquarters. Uh, and when things went bad for them, they, they just sold off their headquarters for about 150 million, 150, yeah, 150 million uh, and it's still there uh, being occupied <coughs> by various Finnish startups. So Nokia were able to get that money back. That was their tangible asset. Things had gone bad. They were able to get that money back. And now what about their major intangible asset? Well, their major intangible asset was the operating system, their software that ran on their phones. If you cast your minds back to Nokia phones, uh, they had an operating system called Symbian. Uh, when they were taken over by Microsoft, that turns into Windows, Mobiles, Win Windows Mobile. And Microsoft famously, famously scrapped Windows Mobile a few years later and wrote off in their accounts around $6 billion. That is to say, the software, the intangible asset, they could not get that money back. The tangible asset, they could sell off and get the money back. The intangible asset turned out they just couldn't get any money for it. It could, turned out to be completely useless. There was no resale value. <clears throat> so that's why we think of intangibles as being relative to tangibles, being much more sunk. It's much more difficult to get that money back. Okay, two more properties. Uh, the first is spillovers. Uh, if you've got a tangible asset like a factory, that's easy to protect. You put a security guard outside your factory, other people can't use the factory. Uh, if you've got an intangible asset like the design of an iPhone, well, again, if you cast your minds back, what phones, smartphones looked like before the iPhone is they all looked, well, looked a bit weird, really. You know, looking back at them with kind of weird clunky keyboards and funny bits that folded out and all that kind of thing. Within about 18 months after the invention of the iPhone, all smartphones pretty much looked like the iPhone. That is to say the design, a major intangible asset on the iPhone, the benefits of that design spilled over to the rest of the iPhones. Right? So uh, that's an example, I'd say, of the third S of the spillovers. That uh, here are some pictures here of an HTC and the Samsung phone. That those benefits, as they spilled over uh, to uh, uh, other manufacturers, and then the operating systems as well. Uh, those benefits were copied um, as well. So an intangible asset, uh, a tangible asset, is easier to defend. An intangible asset uh, is rather harder. Okay. The last S is about synergies. Is about the benefits from putting these intangible assets together. Uh, We've got a little case study uh, in the book of the EpiPen. So the EpiPen, fantastic invention, uh, um, you know, protecting people against anaphylactic shocks, uh, is itself a bundle of intangible assets. So let's just spend a minute thinking about the intangible assets besides the EpiPen. You might think to yourself, wait, wait a moment, this is a pharmaceutical, right? So it's got to be protected by a patent. You know, well, I study lots of patents. I've been to university, I've done my course on this and the other, innovation and all that, study lots of patents. So the patent is the intangible asset. Not very difficult to understand why it is the EpiPen does so well. Well, it turns out that the patent expired about 90-odd years ago. So it's not protected by a patent. So it's clearly an important element of the EpiPen, but just by itself, it can't be the source of the EpiPen's commercial success because anybody can use the formula uh, for, the, for the chemical, for the stuff that's in the EpiPen. Uh, it, it is bundled, however, with design, so the EpiPen kind of looks good and it's all sort of easy to handle, so that's another intangible asset. Uh, there's also an enormous amount of branding around the EpiPen as well. I mean, when people often talk about you know, saving children, adults, whatever, for an anaphylactic shock. So they often talk about the EpiPen itself. They, they, in, the, in the same way that people used, the word, used to use the word Hoover for a vacuum cleaner, uh, they, they talk about the EpiPen itself. There's a lot of branding. Uh, and there's a lot of marketing and distribution around the EpiPen um, as well. Indeed, some statutory instruments 
uh, which, tell, which give um, information about where the EpiPen has to be positioned and all that kind of thing, actually talk about the EpiPen itself rather than the generic uh, name for the drugs, actually talk about the specific, um, uh, the specific item itself. Uh, and then finally, there's lots of training done. Uh, uh, people are, are trained to operate these things. And here on the title here, it says anaphylaxis and EpiPen training. So these bundles of intangible assets put together are the final of our four S's. Uh, and we think if you bundle these together, then you can get particularly valuable uh, uh, um, returns from these intangible assets. OK, so uh, from those four S's, as I say, we think a lot of uh, hopefully interesting properties of the economy uh, follow. Why don't I pass over to Stian, who's going to take us through some of those. Thank you, Jonathan. So this is where we kind of deliver on our promise that these intangible assets help explain some of the big puzzles of the economy and the politics more generally. And I'm going to talk about four things here. I'm firstly going to talk about um, which businesses do well, which businesses do badly, and what that means for economic growth. I'm going to talk about, at a more human level, who does well and who does badly in this kind of economy. I'm going to talk about the question of finance and what our financial system needs to do to support the kind of capital development of an intangible economy. And then I'm going to finish with a few thoughts on public policy. Um, and it would be great to, 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 to throw it open to discussion. Um, these charts are not ours, but I think they, 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 they're very important. This is some work done by the OECD in recent years that basically looks at the growing gap between the most profitable and productive businesses in any given country, in any given sector, and the laggards, the ones that are not doing so well. And the big so what of both these charts is that there are these frontier firms that seem to be, in, uh, for the last 20 years, seem to have been pulling away from the crowd. The gap between the best firms and the rest is, has been growing. Um, really very detail-driven work that the OECD have been, done, uh, been doing. And it's been, people have then built on this. There's a fascinating US paper by Song and Bloom that have looked at how this actually drives income inequality as well. So we often think of income inequality as being the difference between sort of CEOs and cleaners. But actually what Song and Bloom has shown is that a very significant proportion of the kind of dizzying rise in inequality and income inequality in the past few decades has actually been caused by the rise of, the, the, sorry, the growing gap between f the best firms and the rest. Um, so this is kind of significant from a sort of social justice point of view. Um, but it's also led people to look for explanations. What's going on here? And the OECD, for example, has speculated that maybe this is because technologies are not diffusing quickly enough from the best firms to the rest. Maybe people just haven't got the memo that there's lots of great technology going out there. Maybe they need to write, read Wired magazine more. Um, or maybe the competition policy is not working. Maybe our kind of regulators are asleep on the job or they're becoming more venal or there's too much money in politics or something like this. So these kind of arguments are put about and people worry a lot. Um, we think that intangibles help explain some of this growing gap, which on one level is kind of useful to understand, on another level is quite troubling if this is a long-term trend. Um, I'm going to come back to some of the three of the four characteristics of intangibles that Jonathan mentioned earlier. The first being scalability. Um, Jonathan talked about how Uber is scalable in a way that a minicab firm isn't, or rather Uber's algorithms are. Certainly, if you believe that intangible assets are becoming more important, then, for example, the fact that a ride-sharing algorithm is very scalable across a large business will increase the productivity and the profitability gap between Uber and between kind of your local taxi firm. Similarly, to the extent that a brand is scalable, if brands are becoming more important than the gap between, say, Starbucks with a very recognized and valuable intangible asset in brand, the gap will grow between that and your kind of local, local cafe. So scalability means that the firms that are doing very well and have valuable intangibles will be able to do even better. We also talked about spillovers, the idea that if you invest in an intangible, you can't be sure that you will get the benefit. Other firms might either be able to share in the benefit or indeed appropriate the whole benefit. Um, and you'd think this would be kind of a good thing for your laggard firms. you think it would give everyone a kind of fair crack of the whip. But of course, the ability to benefit from other people's ideas is not evenly distributed. Some firms appear to be very good at not only benefiting from their own ideas, but kind of going out there and capturing the benefit for other people, from other people's ideas. So much so that there is indeed a whole discipline that you can learn at business schools called open innovation, which is very much about, from a firm's point of view, learning from other people's ideas, or to put it another way, appropriating the benefits of other people's intangible assets. So again, if you believe that there are some firms, and some of these firms are 
highly profitable firms like Google that are really good at accepting other people's ideas. That could lead to a widening gap as well. Um, and then finally, Jonathan talked about synergies, this idea that a lot of intangible ideas are particularly good when you bring them together with other intangibles. Um, this also creates something of a Matthew effect, you know, to those firms that have more will be given. And here's a really fun chart that I saw in a BuzzFeed article recently. This was a sort of a screenshot from the, uh, the Apple App Store. Um, and it basically showed that they looked at the top, well, the, the, the sort of the top apps, and it turned out that Facebook was either responsible for making most of the top, uh, top apps, or because of the value in the Facebook platform and how synergistic it was with these other bits of software, that they'd either acquired them or were in the process of trying to acquire or cloning them. So if you're a company that's got lots of valuable intangibles as well, you're more likely to benefit from those synergies. So again, in a synergistic economy, the benefit for big companies you think would grow. Um, and we think more speculatively that this could help explain this curious phenomenon of secular stagnation. Um, the economists in the audience will be familiar with this idea, but secular stagnation is this kind of puzzle that investment in the economy appears to be on the low side, um, but return on investment, so the firms that are making investments seem to be showing kind of high levels of corporate profits and delivering a good return, and that persists even when interest rates are low. So when interest rates are low, money is cheap and firms, all other things being equal, should want to invest more. So this is kind of a puzzle why all these things should persist at once. But we believe that in an economy where you have leaders who have an entrenched position because of intangible assets, this, might, you, this, this situation might obtain. So, you know, your leading firms, they've got a strong invest, incentive to invest in intangibles, and intangibles as well. Um, they get spillovers from other people's in, intangibles, and those things together generate high investment, but also high profits, high ROI. So your leader firms look like they're doing well, and the headline profits in the economy look like they're doing very well. Your laggard firms, on the other hand, they don't have synergies, so the incentive to invest in intangibles is relatively low. If they do, they may very well not get the benefits because some else, someone else will appropriate the benefits anyway. So they exhibit low investment, low ROI, and the kind of this, this manifests itself overall as low investment. So kind of possible explanation for secular stagnation, and um, it's sort of one of the things that people like Brad DeLong, who think about secular stagnation generally, thinks might be part of the, part of the, the reason for this troubling phenomenon. Um, I said I'd talk about next who does well out of this economy and who does badly. And in this context, it's worth by starting by saying that intangibles tend to be contested. And this, to me, is kind of a key document to understand in thinking about why intangibles are, are contested. This is the oldest human law code. It's in a museum in Istanbul. It's the law code of ur um, who was a king in Sumeria, 2,000 years BC. Um, and in this law code, the first expression of human written law described in very recognisable terms are the ownership of what we would call tangible assets. Horses, fields, animal, uh, houses, all these, kind of, all these kind of things. So the idea that you can own tangible assets is kind of as old as written law itself. Human beings have had a long time to get used to what it means to own, in, to own tangible assets. Now, if you sort of ask a historian, where is the oldest law code that describes the ownership of intangible assets? Um, it's a kind of a bit of a moot point. This is the Statute of Anne, which describes copyright in 1710. You might be able to push it back to about 1500 with various sort of rules on things that are a bit like patents. But fundamentally, it's three and a half thousand years after this kind of thing. And I'm a historian by training. I think it takes human beings a long time to, dis to establish and get comfortable with social institutions. So from this point of view, you would argue that rules over who owns intangible assets are just inherently going to be less settled than rules over who owns tangible assets. So I think it just takes human beings a long time to work these things out. Um, the reason, and this has an implication for all sorts of things. It particularly has an, invest, a, a, um, an effect on willingness to invest. And if you'll allow me to use an analogy here, um, the analogy of barbed wire. So this relates to a tangible asset, but the moral of this story is about how when you don't know who owns an asset, your incentive to invest is lower. Um, if you had a farm, an arable farm, in the Wild West in the 19th century, um, one of the big occupational hazards was that from time to time some cattle baron would drive all their cows onto your farm. The cows would eat all your wheat or alfalfa or whatever, and then they'd trample off. So being an arable farmer in the Wild West was a pretty risky business. 
Um, and consequently, if you look at measured arable productivity and measured arable investment in the 19th century in the US, it was pretty low, and there are economic historians who look at this kind of thing. But in this particularly fascinating economic history paper by Hornbeck in 2007, he looked at a technology shock. It turns out that in the late 19th century, they invented barbed wire. And barbed wire is a really cheap way of keeping the cattle baron's cattle off your crops. And it turns out that this shock, when this cheap technology became available, in places where it was otherwise difficult to build fences, investment in fields, you know, digging ditches and fertilising and things like this, massively increased. So the argument is, if you can protect your right to own an asset, all other, things, all other things being equal, you will invest more in it. And this kind of is interesting if you come back to the fact that intangible assets are contested. It's relatively hard to decide who owns them, to decide who even has a right to own these kind of things. You would expect to see all, of the, all other things being equal, less investment and more problematic situations around investment. The other thing you would expect to see is that there would be benefits to being the kind of person who can resolve this contestedness, who can state claims to intangible assets and establish either legal claims or social claims to, 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 being, able to, 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 to being able to benefit from them. And if we think about some of the different types of people who have benefited from an intangible economy, the first kind of group is what you might call heroic entrepreneurs. I mean, Elon Musk is the sort of the, the, the poster child for this. But effectively, what Elon Musk is trying to do, we don't know whether he'll succeed or not, is to bring together a bunch of intangible assets, a bunch of R&D, a bunch of marketing, in a number of systems like electricity generation, solar power, electric cars. Um, he's trying to make the most of those synergies. He's trying to uh, state claims to, 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 to intangibles in these spaces. If it works, if this kind of almost like sort of Ayn Randian kind of will to power works, then he will do very well and people like that will do very well. Um, similarly, people who can use political power to resolve some of these problems will do well. Um, this is Neely Kreuss, former European commissioner who was hired by Uber in Europe. Um, you can see why it would be useful for Uber, a business that has lots of contested intangibles, like their very complex labour relations with their partner drivers, which is clearly a hot and contested social topic, why it's helpful for them to have politically connected employees. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting, so Robert Reich, a US economist in the early 90s, wrote a book or wrote eloquently about symbolic analysts, kind of white collar workers whose job appeared to be about negotiating claims between different things that sort of felt very woolly, what we would call intangibles. So I think your sort of symbolic analysts, people who work in marketing, people who work in legal services, people who work in kind of jobs that 100 years ago people wouldn't have thought of proper jobs, are going to be increasingly important in this kind of contested economy. And then finally, the argue, the, there is a case that the perceived importance of business leaders will increase. If, there is an import, if it's important to coordinate these intangibles and to lay claim to things, you could see that the role of charismatic business leaders would, in, would increase. And you know, this is certainly consistent with a kind of long-term story about the war for talent and, <coughs> and so forth that's seen such a rise in executive pay in the last 30 years. Um, Another thing that's kind of going to be in, important in this contested economy where assets have spillovers and have synergies um, is the urban landscape. Um, spillovers and synergies are beneficial things. If you run a business in an intangible economy, you want to take advantage of them. You want to get the benefits from where ideas come together. And although for a long time people have been prophesying this thing called the death of distance where we'll all kind of telecommute and exchange ideas electronically, it has stubbornly refused to happen. Distance seems to be really hearty and alive and well, despite these prophecies of its death. So what that does mean is that big cities are increasingly important, and what economists will call the agglomeration effects, the kind of economic benefits of glomming lots of people together in one place, would seem to increase. Um, that obviously has political consequences. I don't know if any of you would recognise this. This is an artist's impression of a lovely new development that was planned until recently on the Isle of Dogs in East London. Um, Unfortunately, uh, demo democracy being what it was, the local residents rejected the planning application because they wanted to protect this vital and picturesque um, <laughs> petrol station on the Isle of Dogs, which would have had to be knocked down to build one of these things. Um, now, obviously, democracy is a really important thing, and you know, we should, people should have the right to refuse the building of things that they don't want to build. But it does mean that these planning restrictions will become a costlier luxury as um, as these agglomeration effects, as the benefits of being in cities increases as the intangible economy becomes more important. Um, 
There's also kind of an important crossover here with inequality that we were talking about before. Um, Jonathan talked about Thomas Piketty and his kind of transformational work on, on wealth inequality recently. Um, one of the interesting follow-ons from that was the work by Matt Honglier and actually by a bunch of French economists who no one talked about because they wrote in French before Honglier, um, that if you go through a lot of Piketty's data, particularly for France, particularly for the US, a ton of this perceived increase in wealth over the last 40 years was actually driven by the increase in property prices. And to the extent that where this property is getting more valuable is not kind of rural property, farmland, houses in Detroit, it's houses in prime urban locations. We see a kind of link between the growth of the intangible economy and a ton of the inequality that um, Piketty so eloquently wrote about. Um, another kind of curious thing is that these synergies, the fact that these ideas kind of come together in interesting combinations, might mean that the natures of city clusters will be changing. This is Youngstown, Ohio, a steel town. Everything in Youngstown was about steel. Steel was in the air. And it was kind of a great example of um, the kind of clusters that Alfred Marshall, the old Cambridge economist, wrote about in the early 20th century. Um, it's quite possible that we will see a shift away from these single industry clusters to clusters that do kind of everything. And there's some really tantalizing research by Shane Greenstein um, at Harvard who looked at patenting by city in the US. The blue line is Silicon Valley, the Bay Area. And over the last 30 years, patenting, 40 years, patenting has risen in the Bay Area. Bay Area has become re responsible for more and more patents. But also, interestingly, it's been responsible for a greater share of non-computer patents, non-ICT patents. So the argument is, at least there, a place that was once good at one thing, software and semiconductors, is now becoming good at everything. That might be a story about software, but it might also be a story about how these synergies are becoming increasingly important has big impacts for cluster policy. Um, this also has big social connotations. Um, this is a fun map from the New York Times just after the US presidential election. This is the, the bits of America that voted for Hillary Clinton. And this is pretty much a map of thriving urban and semi-urban areas and kind of everywhere else voted for, for, for the other guy. Um, and I think this is particularly interesting if we get back to this question of populism, because you know, there have always been cultural divides between, you know, the court and the country once upon a time or between the, the sort of the, the, the thriving cities and the left, thri less thriving cities. Um, but we think what's interesting here is these long-standing cultural divides in an intangible economy where more and more goes on in cities will be underpinned by economic divides. So if you're looking for a reason why um, populism seems to be particularly fierce now, it might be that these underlying economic facts, this underlying rise of the intangible economy that privileges a certain, a certain cosmopolitan part of the population, um, uh, that might be the reason. Um, so if we go through these kind of inequality angles, you know, we've got wealth inequality, which, as we said, is significantly driven by property <coughs> prices. If we're seeing intangible economies driving up the importance of global cities, then there's an intangible link there. To the extent that income inequality is driven, as Song and Bloom said, by these <coughs> gaps between the leading firms and the laggard firms, we're seeing intangibles driving a wedge between those firms as well. And finally, if you think about status inequality or inequality of esteem, this idea that there's a large part of the population that feels disrespected and looked down on by, by kind of a, what they see as a shallow liberal elite, um, you see something where the kind of long-standing cultural divides might be being underpinned by growing economic divides, potentially making them more fierce. Um, in terms of what this means for the kind of rules that we look at, one clear question is the kind of question about inter intellectual property. Intellectual property is one way of governing claims to some types of intangible assets. And I think here there's a real dilemma for, for, for policymakers because there's a sort of clash between two of these characteristics of, of, of intangibles that Jonathan talked about, between the spillovers and the synergies. Um, on the one hand, there is one way of looking at intangible property that's about resolving this spillover problem. How do you encourage firms to invest when they can't be sure that they will get the benefit of their investment? Um, this is Blind Willie Johnson. Blind Willie Johnson was a blues singer. His, uh, one of his songs was inscribed on the Voyager Golden Record, which was the, 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 sort of the contribution that was humanity's greatest cultural artifact that he sent out into space. Um, Blind Willie Johnson um, died broke, um, homeless, because he made no money from these kind of tremendous cultural 
developments that, that, that he was solely responsible for. So clearly that's the kind of the, the one side of the problem of appropriating the spillovers of intangibles. Um, the flip side is, this is what's sometimes known as the Mickey Mouse chart. This is how, over time, copyright terms in the US have been extended year after year in a way that just happens to keep Mickey Mouse, the Disney Corporation's very valuable intellectual property, in copyright. Um, so on the one hand, you don't want a world in which creators don't prosper from their creations, otherwise no one would, well, the incentive to create stuff will be considerably reduced. On the other hand, if you, you put in place a lot of legal apparatus to protect, uh, to protect people's intellectual property, there's the danger of gaming, there's the danger of regulatory capture. So that's one challenge. But of course, at the same time, if you believe there are these synergies from bringing together, intellect, bringing together intellectual property and intangibles more generally, you kind of want to create a system where those synergies can happen. Um, we're often asked in policy, where will the next Spotify come from? And Spotify was an innovation that was fairly rigor uh, vigorously resisted by the music industry until they decided to stop resisting it. And it turns out that now, certainly in the UK, 25% of the music industry's revenues come from Spotify. Spotify works because the intellectual property regime was sufficiently flexible that you could bring together the software assets of Spotify and the, uh, the, 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 the artistic original rights of the music industry. If you have very, very strict IP law, that stuff is relatively hard to, hard to make it work. So there's this kind of tension. One, I mean, this is a sort of standard economist argument, but one way we can potentially re address some of this is by having greater clarity around IP rules and better markets for trading some of these rights. Um, but, you know, this, the dilemma remains. Um, I talked about financing as well. How do you finance the capital development of this, of, 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 of this kind of economy? And here we face a problem. The first problem relates to sunkenness, this characteristic Jonathan was talking about earlier. Banks don't like lending to businesses with sunken assets. Um, if you're a bank or a bondholder, if you're a provider of debt finance, what you really like is companies that if they go bust, they've got lots of lovely things that you could acquire and sell off and get some of your money back. Intangible investments, because they're sunk, like the Symbian operating system that Jonathan talked about earlier, it's harder for bondholders to get stuff back. And that's a problem in an economy that, like our economy, which is largely geared towards debt finance rather than equity finance. Um, we have very significant tax breaks that encourage debt rather than equity finance. <coughs> and indeed, the banking system, the idea of business lending, that's by definition debt finance. If we think about how we address this, kind of it's a tough one. Um, there is a sort of small and growing market in IP-backed lending, so lending against certain types of intangible assets. And there's some kind of interesting experiments going on. A company called MCAM, UK IPO, is doing some stuff in other countries. Um, but I think our broad position is that you would expect over time to see or to see necessitated a shift towards more equity finance. On one hand, that would require tax changes, so the famous Miralees review into, uh, into tax argued that we should equalise the tax treatment of equity and debt. That would be a, an enormous shift if we did it, but there's a case for that. Um, but it would also require a ton of institution building because our institutions, for the most part, are geared around debt finance and the, 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 those few that are not, like the kind of California venture capital sector, are extremely small and geared towards very, very limited type of businesses. That's one problem. The other problem relates to kind of public equity markets, stock markets. Um, and this is particularly a problem around spillovers, the fact that it's sometimes quite hard to appropriate the benefits of these assets. Um, this is a CT scanner, a really important medical innovation. The CT scanner was invented by EMI, who I certainly think of as a record company back in the 1960s. They were a kind of industrial conglomerate. They were electrical and mechanical industries is what it stood for. Um, EMI invented the CT scanner. Godfrey Hounsfield was their kind of whiz kid engineer who developed the thing. He won a Nobel Prize. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, great result for, 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 for Godfrey Hounsfield and for humanity as a whole. Not a great result for EMI shareholders who made no money at all out of this, despite the fact that they invested a ton in research and development in sales and marketing and all these intangible assets. It turns out that GE and Siemens captured the market very quickly and EMI made very little money. So in a world where intangible assets are quite slippery and tend to get away from the firm that makes them, this creates kind of a problem for backing these things through public equity, through, 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 through companies floated on the stock market. Um, on the one hand, this, you'd think this would increase the benefits of diversification for equity investors, because you know, if you own shares in EMI, 
and Siemens and GE, you make money from this development, regardless of, of whether one company does well or not. But the flip side is, there's some really interesting work from Alex Edmonds, an economist at London Business School, who's looked at how concentrated ownership, so shareholders who have large stakes in these companies are actually more disposed to have their companies make intangible investments because they're better equipped to scrutinise the investment and therefore to overcome some of these problems of short-termism that you sometimes get around R&D. So there's a bit of a paradox where on the one hand it's good to have diversified investment, on the other hand there's a real benefit to being specialised and indeed that is the way we tend to see equity markets going. There's a lot of general passive investors and a few increasingly specialised hedge funds that are, that are focusing. So kind of a challenge there with that dilemma. Um, better reporting might help a little bit, but it's probably quite difficult. Venture capital and private equity of other sorts can address some of these things, but it's difficult to pin too many hopes on that. But fundamentally, we're in a situation where our current institution are relatively poorly equipped to, to provide this kind of economy with the capital development it needs. Um, if we think about the sort of public policy implications of this, one of the obvious ones is in the very long term we would expect to see a need for more public investment. This is a chart looking at public government-funded government R&D versus intangible investment. This sort of seems to support the argument that public investment in R&D crowds in private investment in intangibles generally, which is kind of reassuring to hear, specific, especially with my day job that we're trying to increase public R&D spending. Um, but I think this kind of raises some questions as well. Um, we kind of know, broadly speaking, how to spend public money on research. I mean, there are details that need to be filled out, but it's something that governments were doing for quite a while. The practice is kind of uh, at least not totally underdeveloped. Um, but it's rather more difficult to know how to spend public money on other things. There's a lot of controversy over, say, publicly funded artistic originals, which is the BBC. You know, we don't quite know how to do that in a way that stimulates the wider economy. If you go to Paris, you can use a publicly owned Uber clone called My Taxi, which is a great example of a public intangible, but you know, we don't know. Should the public be providing more of these platforms? Should it not be? I think this is something where we're very much finding our way from a public administration point of view. Um, and I guess the, the, the kicker here is if we need to be investing more in these kind of areas, how easy is this to do if in our politics, we're seeing a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots and the rise of populism that undermines the credibility of these kind of things. So the need for public investment in these areas is growing, but the political legitimacy is being challenged. So a real, a real issue there. Anyway, there's much more in the book. We would love you to, 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 to read it if you haven't had the chance. We've got some fun stuff about the Beatles, about Donald Trump, about microwave ovens, um, the pros and cons of IP. We haven't got quite policy recommendations, but we have things that policymakers should be thinking about, and we've got management tips as well. We've been very kindly reviewed by various periodicals, and um, we, would, we, would, we would love to, to, to hear your contribution to the debate. Thank you.